Thank you for tuning into Tag Church here in Little Rock, Arkansas. We pray that this message will truly be a blessing to you today. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can do so by visiting us at www.tagchurch.net. Also, if you have any prayer requests, please don't hesitate to send them to the email request on your screen. We would love to partner with you in prayer. Now, I hope you are ready for a word from the Lord today. Let's get right into it, and God bless you. Well, amen. Ezekiel chapter number 22. I want to continue this morning our sad scripture summer sermon series. Wow, say that three times real fast. Sad scriptures summer sermon series. I can't even say it fast. Sad Scripture Summer Sermon Series. Amen. Try that three times real fast. See what that sounds like. Hallelujah. How's everybody doing today? Amen. How many of you love the Lord? How many of you love your pastor? How many of you promise to love me an hour from now? (laughs) Just checking. Just checking. Amen. Because this message today is not for the spineless. It's not for the faint at heart. I hope you brought some steel-toed shoes this morning. Amen. As one pastor said to me last night, he said, this kind of preaching, Dwayne, will not make you popular, but it will make you a watchman. And I need you to understand, I don't care anything about being popular. I got over that in the eighth grade. When I was bullied and made fun of, I thought, well, this I'm never going to be popular. Why, why even try? Amen. But I do see myself as a watchman, as a prophet to the nations, as a messenger that sounds the alarm. Are you hearing me today? So in case you're curious, we have ten doors in this sanctuary that you have access to to exit at any time. I'm just saying I'm not holding anybody here in any kind of hostage situation. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're not holding you hostage today. I hope no one leaves and I hope everybody watching via live stream and even you in this room, would you go to Facebook or YouTube and share today's stream because... I I, I really, my heart is for everybody to hear this. Matter of fact, and I say this with all humility, I wish this could be heard all across the nation. But for this season in my life, God's called me to be a watchman for this house. And where it goes from here is His business, but for this season, as long as I'm the pastor of this church, whether that's for another month or another year or another 10 years or until the rapture happens, I'm a watchman for Trinity Assembly of God in Little Rock, Arkansas. This series, Sad Scriptures, has been a tough one. I never thought it would be. When the Lord said, I want you to do a series on Sad Scriptures, uh, I thought it'd be just a kind of a fun summer thing to do in the summer get us through the summer until everybody decides to come back to church regularly and we just do a few weeks together. I had no idea that it would have the the intensity and the depth of rhema word that it's had. Are you following me? How many of you believe we've heard from God these past few Sundays in this series? We have. We're going to hear from Him again today by looking at Ezekiel Chapter 22, one verse, today's sad scripture. When you're reading the Bible, daily reading the Word, reading your three chapters of Psalms and of Proverbs or however you do it every day, and all of a sudden you come across a verse and it just causes you to stop and you go, wow, that's sad. Verse 30 did that to me. He said, and I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it 
but I found none. Let me read it one more time. And I sought for a man, God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel. I searched, I looked for a man, one man on the earth, who should build up the wall and stand in the gap or stand in the breach. But I found none. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would captivate every heart, every spirit in this room. And I pray once again you would speak to us. God, I pray that your people sitting in these chairs today would not entertain the thought that all we do is talk about what we're against. But may they today acknowledge that there's been a breach in the church in America. And somebody has got to say something. Somebody's got to stand in the gap. Somebody's got to repair the breach to keep these devils, to keep these spineless preachers, to keep these false prophets out of the church house. And I pray, God, that there would not be one person that would entertain the idea that that's pastor's job alone, but that every person in this room would say, Lord, if you're seeking for a man or a woman to stand in the breach, here I am. Here I am. Use me. Help me to stand for righteousness. When it seems everybody in the church is going in an apostate direction, further away from your word, further away from the Spirit, even if I feel alone, may I be found going in the correct direction. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Thank you, Pastor Josh. Keep your Bibles open this morning for a moment to Ezekiel 22. The prophet Ezekiel was sent to the nation of Judah. Judah, in this period of time, had turned her back on God and had begun worshiping idols just like Israel had begun to do. Judah had made alliances with foreign nation, and if you know anything about the Old Testament, and if you know anything about Judah and Israel, if you know anything about God's people, you know that God absolutely uh, uh, was against His people coming into any kind of agreements with other nations. Are you hearing me today? They had begun to make alliances with foreign nations and due to this, there was a security breach that had taken place around the, I'm going to say, the walls, the, the, the security of, of Judah. There was a security pr- breach. There was a gap in the walls that allowed access to Judah's enemies, even though Judah might have considered them alliances, might have considered them friends. Hear me today, friend. They were enemies of God's people, and they now had access to God's people. What is happening here in Ezekiel chapter number 22? If you're taking notes, I want you to catch a few of these. Number one, the prophets were making merchandise of the people. Number one, the prophets made merchandise of the people. If you look at verse number 25 of Ezekiel 22, it says in your Bibles, it says that the conspiracy, everybody say conspiracy, 
The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They've devoured human lives and they've taken treasure and precious things and they've made many widows in their midst. Skip down to verse number 28. It says, and her, speaking of Judah, Judah's prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and, 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 and divining lies for them, saying, Thus saith the Lord when the Lord had not spoken. Did you hear that today? The nation of Judah, the pulpit, was in trouble. The prophets, the pulpit during that time, the Bible says here in verse 25 that there was a conspiracy amongst the false prophets, the false teachers of that time, and the conspiracy was to fill the land of Judah with false prophets and with false teaching. The conspiracy was to fill fill the pulpits with false teaching which would do this. Hear me today. It would drown out the voice of the true prophets like Ezekiel and like Jeremiah of that time. The idea was if we can get more of us saying false things and prophesying false lies and saying thus says the Lord when the Lord didn't say, then they'll begin to listen to us more than they'll listen to the few prophets who really have received a word from God out of a prayer closet are you hearing me today and in return it was making merchandise of the people they begin to preach things that people wanted to hear they begin to prophesy things that people would actually come and begin to pay these false prophets for such a, an encouraging word for such a word that uh, is so inspirational they didn't want to hear what Jeremiah the preacher whose word of God was like fire shut up in his bone. They didn't want to hear Ezekiel who would see a vision and come and bring a word of damnation to the people of God. They were willing to pay Pastor Dennis to receive something that they wanted to hear. Does it sound like the American church today? Number two, if you're taking notes, not only were the prophets making merchandise of the people, but number two, the priests were violating instead of teaching the law. They were violating the, wall, the law instead of teaching the law. Look at it in verse number 25. The Bible says the conspiracy of her prophets, uh, uh, excuse me, verse number 26, it says, uh, 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 it says her priests have done violence. Everybody say violence have done violence to my law. They've profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Neither have they taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. They've disregarded my Sabbath, and so I have profaned among them. Friend, this verse right here is loaded. I could preach the rest of the morning on that right there. What God was saying is that the priests were violating the law rather than, rather than teaching the law. He says here in verse 26, They've done violence. They profane my holy things. He's saying there's no distinction anymore between holy things and common things. Can I put it in American church Christianity language for you today? He was saying this. He was saying when I walk into the church house, there's no difference between the holy and the entertainment that I can receive at a theater in Branson. It's come together. It's meshing too much where there's no distinction between the clean and the unclean. In other words, I sat and I listened to one of them preachers preach for an hour and I had no I did, they didn't say anything about sin they didn't say anything about uncleanness they didn't say anything about the holiness of God all they did was give me a nice little speech that made me feel good and God was saying judgment is coming to you Judah because your priests have violated my law they violated my law Instead of being custodians of the word, hear me future preachers or preachers sitting in the house today, you are called to be a custodian of the word. You are called to be a keeper of the word of God. We've got to get back to the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, it is the book for me. We've got to get back to standing on the word of God alone. We need some preachers who will be custodians of the law. But instead it says here that they violated the word of God. They denied its 
inspiration. They, de- they denied its authority. Sound familiar, American church? We've got, we've got people today preaching, but not just preaching, sitting in the pews. Barna Research, the majority of Christians sitting in the pew today do not believe that this is the inspired Word of God any longer. Friend, I'm telling you, if you don't believe that this is God's Word, then anything can happen. You want to talk about a security breach, if you don't believe God's Word is the authoritative, divinely inspired Word of God, then anything can go in the church. Anything can go on the platform. Anything will be allowed in the house of God. Because when you degrade God's word, you degrade the author of God's word. And that's almighty God, my friend. Number three, civil rulers were like wolves after the sheep. Look at verse number 27. It says, her princes, her civil leaders in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. This is happening right now in America. You don't need me to tell you that there are wolves in Washington, D.C., and they're destroying lives for dishonest gain, my friends. Look at verse number 29, number 4. People oppress the poor and the strangers. Verse number 29 says, look at it in your Bibles, that the people of the land have practiced extortion. They've committed robbery. They've oppressed the poor and the needy. They've exhorted from the sojourner without justice. So hear me today. God not only dealt with the preachers, the prophets, not only did he deal with the leaders of Judah, the priests of Judah, but now he's dealing with the common people. We find in verse number 29 that the common people had fallen into the same category as the prophets, as the priests, and as the princes, the civil leaders of that time. They took their cue from their leaders. Did you hear me today? They were following the leader. The classic game, classic schoolyard. Follow the leader to the lunchroom. Follow the leader to the recess. Follow the leader to the playground. This is what was happening in Judah. They were following their leaders. Listen to me. As the pulpit goes, so goes the pew. What the pulpit believes, hear me today. What the pulpit preaches, the pew will believe it a year from now. If there's fire in the pulpit, there'll be fire in the pew. If the pulpit's dead, the pew will be dead. I've seen it over and over and over again. You put a fiery preacher in the pulpit, you'll have a fiery church. You put a prayer intercessor in the pulpit you'll have intercessors in the church you put a Holy Ghost filled preacher in your pulpit you'll have a Holy Ghost filled and I don't care how filled up how fired up that church is if that preacher resigns and leaves and you hire you an administrator that could work at the school as a principal as much as he could a preacher at your church and he's dead and he's dry and he doesn't preach the word of God that fired up church that Bible believing church you you don't even have to give it 12 months it'll happen almost overnight you'll have a dead dried up church that doesn't believe the word of God why because the pew follows the pulpit are you hearing me today why is the church in America in trouble not so much because the pews there yet but because the pulpit the platform in America is in trouble there has been a breach of security So what is our text about? It is that God sought for a man to stand against the tide of wickedness. God was looking for a man who would would raise up his voice and, and announce the destruction that's coming if the breach isn't secured. God was looking for a prophet. He was looking for a voice. He said, I sought for a man who would stand in the gap to stand against the tide of wickedness, to stand for truth in the, in the midst of error, to call a nation to repentance. This is what God was looking for. God was wanting to prevent destruction, but he said, I can't find a man. I'm looking for a man that will just stand in the gap, which will prevent me from doing to the land what I'm about to do to the land. You better hear me this morning, Tag Church. You see, the wall was a city's security. A wall, that's why our nation is in the trouble it's in. You can't go to any nation nearly in this world that doesn't have borders that keep that nation secure. 
But you come to America, thank God we got oceans on two sides of us. Think the trouble we'd be in? But we've got a southern border that's nearly wide open right now. And hear me today. Hear me today loud and clear. God instituted nations. God instituted borders. Read your Bible. If you're against borders, you're against what God instituted. God instituted leaders. And part of a civil leader's job is to secure their borders. But right now, we have an issue. We have a breach in security as people are flooding into our nation. And we don't know who they are. As we heard Wednesday night, we don't know what their agenda is you better hear me today friend if we keep letting them pour in nation of America will fall at the hands of the enemy that we've had a breach and allowed them to walk in unauthorized but I ain't running for office y'all don't want me to run for office but I tell you what I am I'm a watchman at tag church I may not be able to secure the southern border, but you better believe I'm going to secure this border. You better believe I'm watching out for this church. Are y'all hearing me today? He sought for a man. The wall was the city's security. A breach in the wall meant that there was now an opening to come and bring possible destruction. But no one would stand in the gap. That's the sad part of today's summer sermon series. God could find no one to repair the breach. So the city, the nation, would now be open to the wrath and the indignation of Almighty God. Look at it again, verse 30. I sought for a man who should build the wall, stand in the breach before me for the land. So I wouldn't destroy it, but I found none. Look at verse 31. Therefore, everybody say therefore. I have poured out. The therefore is there for a reason. Amen. Therefore is therefore because verse 30 says I couldn't find a man to stand in the gap and to keep and to keep the enemy out, ending in its ultimate destruction. So therefore, I've poured out my indignation among them. I've consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I've returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord. Now, I like the way I'm preaching and I read out of the English Standard Version, but I do like a word from the original Hebrew that the King James Version, I think, does a better job translating here in verse number 30, 31 there. In the King James, it reads this way. Let me read it to you. It says, I sought for a man to make up the hedge. Everybody shout hedge. Hedge. To make up the hedge. I sought for someone to stand in the gap. What God is saying is there's two things I'm looking for. I'm looking for a people. I'm looking for a person who will create a hedge around the church, around my people. And I'm looking for someone who will stand in the gap. I'm talking about the breach in the wall where everybody's getting in. I ain't talking about southern border right now. Stay with me. I'm not running for politics. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about false preachers. I'm talking about false teachers. I'm talking about spineless so-called men of God. Come into our pulpits and leading our leading our churches astray. God says, I'm looking for someone to repair wherever that, however that happened, whenever that happened, I'm looking for somebody to repair the breach. I'm looking for someone to stand in the gap and I'm looking for a people who will be a hedge around my church. Can I tell you why Tag Church is the way Tag Church is? Because God has called us to be a people who will be a hedge for the church of Jesus Christ. You better understand your role. I said you better understand your assignment. We are a hedge for the church in America. It ain't getting past us. That watered down, seeker, sensitive nonsense. It ain't getting past us. Are there any revivalists in the house? I ain't talking about traveling evangelists. I'm talking about those of you who have the spirit of revival living inside of you. You know why that spirit of revival is living inside of you? Because you've been called to be a hedge to the church in America. Hey! Hey! Lord, help me stay on target here. If someone, here's the point. If someone doesn't repair the breach, destruction is coming. Judgment is coming. And what you don't understand about judgment coming 
is that judgment always begins in the house of the Lord. If someone doesn't rise up in our hour, listen to me, generation. Listen to me, church that's been asleep for three or four decades now. That God is shaken before, his, before he sends his son to return and rapture us from this place. Listen to me, church that's awakening in this hour. If someone doesn't get in the gap and repair the breach, destruction is coming. And judgment always begins in the house of the Lord. Today there is a gap between God and his people because of an increasing, hear me, disregard for truth. How many of you know it's at an all-time high? A dis I don't care what your Bible says. It's old school. I don't care what your God said. I'll listen. He said that back in years ago before they were driving and flying. Look how we've evolved. Hear me today. Even some of y'all's favorite preacher, T.D. Jakes, who used to be one of my favorite preacher. When the man talks, you can't help but listen because my God, every time he opens his mouth, he's got something powerful to say. But you know, when he was asked his view on homosexuality, in the church and on the platform specifically speaking of homosexuals leading worship his response was my 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 uh, my belief on that issue has evolved and is evolving can i tell you today god's word hasn't evolved god's word isn't evolving just because the world changes God doesn't change. Just because the nation changes, God doesn't change. He's not a God that's evolving. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hey! I don't care if his name is T.D. Jakes. He ain't God. So because of this increasing disregard for truth, the question has to be asked, like it was here in Ezekiel 22, in Ezekiel 22 verse 30, and that is who will stand in the gap? Who will repair the breach? Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 58 verse 12 or look at it on the screen. Isaiah 58 verse 12 says, And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. Now, can I just pause right there and say this? Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. This refers to that which has been ruined because of sin. Your ancient ruins. Where you used to stand on issues. And now, you're a little softer on that. Uh-oh. Oh, y'all got quiet on me now. I know preachers who used to preach against homosexuality until it hit their house. Now they got a kid homosexual so they don't touch it anymore. See, what you, these preachers don't understand is what you allow in God's house, God will allow in your house. I wish I had time to preach everything I want to say this morning. I'm trying. Ancient ruins. Where you used to stand on things and now it's in ruin. It's dealing with sin. It's dealing with the apostasy in the people of God. Read on. It says in verse 12, Isaiah 58, You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. Everybody say generations. In other words, what he was saying is, is, and let me just put it in New Testament 2022 language for us today. He's saying it would be good if the modern church today would go back to their father's generation. Now, I'm not saying we got to do it the way they used to do it, because how many of you know that ain't always going to work decades on down the road, but what we should do is go back to previous generations and look at how they valued the Word, look at how they worshiped, look at how they honored God, look at how they obeyed God. And if we have fallen, he says, I'm looking for somebody who will go back to future generations. 
And he says this in verse 12. i got to get to this. You shall be called the repairer of the breach. He's talking to preachers right there. You shall be called repairers of the breach. There's a breach in the wall. And you shall be called a repairer of the breach. Let me tell you this morning what a security breach is. A security breach, if you're taking notes, catch this. It's when an unauthorized person gains unauthorized access to something, somewhere, or someone. A security breach. Unauthorized person gains unauthorized access. How many of you ever had your Facebook account hacked? I never have. Somebody find some wood. (laughs) But I know there's nothing more annoying when someone hacks your Instagram, Haven. You lose your whole account, got to start a new one. Computer hackers. Computer hackers who hack your online bank accounts. They steal your personal information. They hack into your online accounts. What they've done, hear me, follow me, they've they've caused a security breach because they are unauthorized to have that kind of access to your accounts. There have been throughout the history of America, even even in modern history, many times when President Obama was the president, at the White House, on multiple occasions, where there were security breaches, when somebody got in that wasn't supposed to be in. I mean, you remember when Obama was president, there was a man who got into a state dinner, past secret service security. You remember when Obama was president, half the time, maybe not half, but you remember watching the news, he's in overseas travel, and the Secret Service, who's supposed to be guarding him, were found drunk sleeping at homes of prostitutes. How many remember that a few years ago? I'm talking about the President of the United States, and when the Secret Service falls off their mission, or they fall asleep, or when the Secret Service doesn't check the list and somehow or another somebody gets into a state dinner, it puts the President in harm's way. It creates an opportunity for some sort of destruction to happen. Can I say to you, Tag Church, the church in America, there has been a security breach. I am not sure what has happened to the pulpits in America and to the preachers in America and the churches in America over the last few decades except it appears there has been a breach in security. I wish I could get somebody to help me preach today. You see, a breach, take this down, write it down, a breach is defined as an act of breaking or failing to observe a law, an agreement, or a code of conduct. That's a breach. He said, I'm looking for someone who will stand in the breach. What is the breach? It's defined as the act of breaking or failing to observe a law, an agreement, or a code of conduct. Can I tell you, there's been some code of conduct that's been breached in the church of God. There's behavior in the house of God that, that, that 50 years ago, those people would have been excommunicated from the house of God. Read your Bible, my friend. The Bible specifically teaches us in 1 Corinthians that if there's a brother or a sister who's living in sexual sin, that we, the church, should have nothing to do with them, that we should hand them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh unto the saving of their souls. See, y'all quiet now. Well, Jesus was a friend of sinner. He, he sat and he, he ate with the drunks. and I, You're right, but he didn't drink with them. He didn't have sex with them. He didn't smoke pot with them. He sat with them to win them. Hey! I wonder, are we influencing the world or has the world influenced the church? Somebody shout, there's been a breach. 
There's been a breach. Code of conduct. Oh, the code of conduct. Woo. Anything goes now. If I could tell you stories about some of your favorite preachers, what they do in green rooms, they don't preach here. If I could tell you, oh my Lord, help me Jesus. Hey, let me give you another definition for a breach. It's also defined as a gap in the wall, a barrier, a defense, especially one made by an attacking army. Pastor, what are you trying to say at some point in the not too long past? A wall, hear me, a wall that protected the church from worldly influence was breached. Sometime or another, a wall that protected our pulpits from false doctrine and from false teachers. Sometime or another, Pastor Dennis, it was breached. Sometime or another. Church, I know you ain't going to shout now, but listen to me. On your watch. Come on, could somebody take responsibility for the breach? This is why God couldn't find nobody, because ain't nobody want to take responsibility for why the church is where the church is at today. On your watch, I'm talking to those of you who have been in the church for several decades. Yeah, I'm talking to you. On your watch. It was on our watch that somewhere or another, I don't know when, where, how, but the church allowed the worldly influence to saturate our churches and we allowed our nation to trade its Judeo-Christian values for this anti-Christ agenda that we're dealing with today. I said I don't know when it happened. I don't know how it happened except I will say this. Maybe the nation, maybe the White House, maybe the Supreme Court, maybe, maybe these false prophets and false teachers saw the last few decades the church comfortable in America, the church asleep in America, the the pulpit asleep in America. Maybe he saw that apathetic, lazy spirit take over the church and hear me, when you're asleep, you don't care. I can go to my wife while she's in a sleep and I can say, do you care if I go to Bass Pro and buy a new gun? She's half asleep. She said, I, I don't care. Just turn the light out. Leave me alone. If she's awake, she ain't ever let me spend that kind of money. Y'all better hear me preach today. I'm telling you, I'm preaching better than you're helping me. But when you're asleep, sleep you don't care I believe there was a point in the last few decades that the devil saw the church asleep he saw the pew asleep and he said they won't care they won't care Ugh. on your watch while the church was asleep the enemy came in and he began to sow tares amongst the wheat Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 13. Look at it real quick. I'm hurrying. Matthew 13, verse 24. Matthew 13, the parable of the weeds. It says, He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed. Everybody say good seed. The good seed's the word of God. Kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed the word of God in the field. Verse 25, but while, everybody say while, his men were what? Were what? While the church was asleep. His men, God's men, while the church was asleep, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. And the Bible says that he went away. The enemy came and sowed weeds. What are the weeds? It's what I'm preaching on today. It's the apostates. It's the false teaching. It's the disregard for truth. While the church was asleep, the enemy came in and he began to sow weeds amongst the wheat. Look at it. Verse 26. I'm going to have to get me a big, big print Bible. It's at that point. It has come to that point. I can print my notes big, but I can't print them. Verse 26. So when the plants came up and bore grain... Then the weeds appeared also. Now, don't miss that. The wheat came up and so did the weeds simultaneously. What is that parable telling us? That parable is telling us that the church at the same time will have both the real and the false. 
at the simultaneously, the church has both the true and the false. He says that it appeared also, verse 27, and the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. Look at me. I ain't mad at you today. If you're visiting, you're like, man, this preacher's mad. I ain't mad. Trust me, I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at anybody in this room. But I am ticked off at the devil. My issue is with the enemy. My issue is that because of a breach in the church's walls that once protected us, I mean, my word. The enemy's come in and he sowed these tares. So I've come to sound the alarm this morning. <laughs> I've come to wake us up today. I've come to sound the alarm by saying, one more time, there has been a breach of security. Somebody shout, there's been a security breach. Now, can I show you the breach for just a moment? Now, here's the point where some of you are going to find one of them ten doors. I mean, I've been laid back like this has been like easy, easy, pleasing. But here's the point. Because I'm about to show you. I ain't just going to talk about it. Today, I've been talking about it for nine years as your pastor. And some people go, will you ever switch the subject? No, I will not. Not until we get this thing turned around. Hear me today. Listen to me today. If you want a sermon series on financial investment, I will loan you a Dave Ramsey DVD series. I've got two of them. One's loaned out right now. I've got one more I can loan out. As long as it comes, we'll keep it going. I'm not against, listen, I'll preach the whole counsel of God, but my question is why in a day when Jesus is about to come back and the church is asleep and, and the virgins don't have their lamps filled with oil, why in a day when we're dealing with same-sex marriage as a law in our nation why in a, oh my god help me why in a day when we've got people praying to a gender fluid god why in a why in a day is our pulpit silent on the biggest issues why because god said i've looked for a man and i could not find one so i ain't going to talk about it i'm going to show you the breach and i could spend a whole series showing you this instead i'm going to just take a few minutes to do it I'm going to show you why I preach the way I preach and why I won't quit. I'm going to show you today the state of the church and where it's headed compared to where it was when some of you were children. I've got a few videos I want to show you. And again, I hope this doesn't offend anybody. But I've asked a few people to help me illustrate this message. Well, I didn't ask them. I just... Went to YouTube and I want to take you real quick, don't hit it yet, but I want to take you real quick onto the campus of Duke University. And to all of you Methodist people with a Methodist background, here's what I love about the Assembly of God. Ain't nobody in assemb hardly anybody in an Assembly of God church, Assembly of God. Meaning, very few of you were born into an Assembly of God church. That's what I love about the, it's, the Assembly of God. It's always been that way. It's made up Baptist, Methodist, everybody. You know why they end up at an Assembly of God church? Because they started speaking in other tongues. They found there was more than their Baptist church provide. Y'all are not helping me. Be quiet. Y'all just, just pulling it out of me. Amen. So if your background's been Methodist, hear me today. There was a day the Methodist had it going on. I mean, there was a John Wesley, Holy Ghost, fire, spirit-filled movement in the Methodist church. But today, they're ordaining. So I'm going to take you to Duke University, to a campus where many of our national leaders are at right now that will be leading this nation a few years from now, to their United Methodist Church service on that campus. And their little preacher lady leading the church in prayer to not our heavenly father which art in heaven but to our queer God hit it 
I don't know how long I can take of it. This was a few Good months ago. Good morning, the holy and queer one be with you. Yeah, you Good heard it. morning and welcome to worship. My name is Caroline worship. Camp. I use she, they pronouns. I am the communications coordinator for Duke Divinity Pride, and I am ecstatic to see this worship space so full and so vibrant with color. Thank you all for being here at the first ever Divinity Pride worship collaboration. Uh, yeah, 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 clap, 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 whatever. I don't know how much more I can take of it. We want to thank everybody who had a hand in making this happen, from the chaplain's office to those who folded the bulletins, to the music, and to you. Thank you for being here today. We at Divinity Pride want to create a worship space that honors and celebrates all of our unique Listen. and good identities. Today, you will hear from four amazing speakers and three beautiful soloists who will give words to their experiences with the God who calls them. We want to affirm everyone to be who they truly are, to step into the Holy One's fire that burns away all that says we are not good enough. Yeah, whatever. And refines us by the Pentecostal fire to be who exactly fire. the great queer one calls us to be. The great queer Let one. Let the spirit move you today. Lift your hands and your voices and dance in whatever way is most freeing for you. Would you please stand, step into this worship space, and pray with me the words found in your bulletin and on the screen. Listen to their prayer. Strange one, fabulous one fluid and ever becoming one. Do not allow us to make our ideas of you into an idol. You are as close to us as our own breath, and yet Listen. your essence transcends all that we can imagine. You are mother, father, and parent. You are sister, brother, and sibling. You are drag queen and you trans are drag man queen. and gender fluid. And turn it off! I can't take any more of it. Turn it off. I'm done. See, this is why the church is the, where we're at, because a lot of you, I'm looking at you, and you're sitting there laughing around, like, that's funny. It ain't funny! We're sitting there laughing, oh, that's so, that's so, oh, I can't look at it, that's just ridiculous. It ain't funny! How did we get to that from this? Let's rewind a few years, hit it. According to the Bible, you will never die. Kill the lights. And yeah. you're going to spend a million years, a billion years, in one of two places, according to Jesus. Not according to Billy Graham, but according to Jesus. Jesus talked a great deal about heaven, but he talked three times more about hell than he did heaven. The other writers of the Bible don't have too much to say about hell, but Jesus talked about it all the time. In the Sermon on the Mount, I've had fellows say, I don't believe in hell, I live by the Sermon on the Mount. Well, you've never read the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talked about it. Now, what did he mean by it? He said, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. What did he mean? Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. What did he mean? My question is, how did we get from that to the first video we played? Let me tell you, there's been a breach! There's been a breach. And you know where the breach is? The breach is when we've got these sissy, spineless pulpit jockeys who can't even, who can't even rightfully divide basic things such as Jesus is the only way to God. Yeah. 
I mean, I know I've got brothers and sisters and other pulpits that, that disagree with me about the Trinity. And we may not all stand on the same, stand in the same place in regards to how we baptize. And there may be other little things. But my God, every one of us better get this one right. That there is no other name given unto man by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. Today in America, the largest church in America is in Houston, Texas, pastored by Joel Osteen, which, by the way, his dad was a mighty preacher of the gospel. John Osteen was a spirit-filled, tongue-talking, mighty preacher of the gospel. And I know this is where some of you will want to find one of the ten doors because y'all just love Joel Osteen. But hear me today. There's a lot I like about Joel Osteen. I mean, when I'm having a bad day, I turn him on just to get, just to feel better about myself. Hear me. Uh, There's a lot I like about him. But what I don't like about him is he can't even look into a camera on a talk show like Larry King Live and, and and boldly preach that unless you're saved and unless Jesus is the Lord of your life, you will not go to heaven. Some of y'all are smarter than the, the pastor of the largest church. Let me ask you, how many of you believe atheists will go to heaven? See, y'all smarter than Joe. How many of you, know, how many of you believe that, that Gentiles that, that have not received Jesus will go to heaven? Y'all some smart people. Hit that video. Uh, we've had ministers on who said, your record don't count. You either believe in Christ or you don't. If you believe in Christ, you are, you are going to heaven. And if you yeah. don't, no matter what you've done in your life, yeah. you ain't. Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, there's probably a, a balance between, I believe you have to know Christ. But I think that if you know Christ, if you're a believer in God, you're going to have some good works. And I think it's a cop-out to say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't ever do anything to well, help What anybody. if you're Jewish or Muslim and you don't accept Christ at all? You know, I, I just, I'm very careful about saying who and would and wouldn't go to heaven. I don't know. I think only God. you believe you have to believe in Christ. I so believe. They're, they're wrong, aren't they? Well, people? I don't know if I believe they're wrong. I believe here's what the Bible teaches. And from the Christian faith, this is what I believe. But I just think that only God can judge a person's heart. I've spent a lot of time in India with my father. And, uh, you know, I don't know all about their religion. But I know they love God. And I don't know. I'd have to, you know, I've seen their sincerity. So... I don't know. I just, I know for me and what the Bible teaches, I want to have a relationship with Jesus. But Phoenix, Arizona, hello. Hello, Larry. You're the best. Thank and you. thank you, Joel, Joel, for your positive messages and your book. I'm wondering, though, um, why you sidestepped Larry's earlier question about how we get to heaven. Um, the Bible clearly tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light, and the only way to the Father is through him. That's not really a message of Listen. condemnation, but of truth. Yeah, I would agree with her. I believe that. So then That's a what Jew is not going to hell. No, I. I, I mean, you can't. Well, no, here's my thing, Larry. Is I can't judge somebody's heart. You know, I don't know. Only God can look at somebody's heart, and so I don't know. I just, to me, it's not my business to say, you know, this one is or this one isn't. I'm just saying, here's what the Bible teaches, and I want to put my faith in, uh, you know, in Christ. And I, I just, I think it's wrong when we go around saying, you know, you're not going, you're not going, you're not going, because it's not exactly my way. I'm just, I'm but not going to be believe the your way. I believe my way. I believe my way with all my heart. But For someone who doesn't share it, well, it is wrong, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I mean. Well, I don't know if I look at it like that. I would, I would present my way, but I'm just going to let God be the judge of that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. So you make no judgment on anyone? No, but I... About pres- atheists? No, I just, you know what? I'll what let, about atheists? I'll let somebody, let, I'm going to let God be the judge of who goes to heaven and hell. And I just, again, I present the truth. And I say it every week. You know, I believe it's a relationship with Jesus. Shut it off. But you know what? I'm not going to go around. He said five times, I, I, just, I just present the truth. I didn't hear the truth one time. I've worked with my father over in India. Listen, those are a bunch of Hindus. And you know what he said? He said, I just, I, I just, I know they love God and they're sincere. When did we get to a place where you can make it to heaven just because you're sincere? There's been a breach. Well, watch Billy Graham on Johnny Carson when he was asked pretty much the same question. Hit it. A pomp that goes with it, and they kind of got on me. But you know, the, the fear of death is gone when a person, uh, when, I, when I found Christ as my Lord and my Savior, 
uh, the fear of death was taken away, and now I'm just as certain that when I die, that I'm going into another world that's just as real as this one, uh, that it's taken, it's helped me to, to face life here and now. That was my question, what and you envision after that's death. That's right. Well, I envision heaven. And uh, I'm not going there because I've preached to a lot of people. I'm not going there because I've read the Bible. I'm not going there because I'm good. I'm going there because of what Christ did for me on the cross. I'm saved by the grace of God. Now, the word grace carries with it the idea that I don't deserve it. I can't buy my way. I can't work my way. I'm a sinner, just like you. And just like... Uh, Come on! <laughs> just like Ed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you folks. <laughs> Excuse me for interrupting. It's a terrible. I hate to stop when we're just... Got it? Here's some more. Can y'all take any more? Here's a short one. Message. It's loud, it's celebratory. People packed Calvary United Methodist Church in Durham Saturday. They called it Drag Me to Church. Drag Me to Church. It, it brings such good and positive energy. Chris Agaranos is the church's pastor and is behind all members. I told them as their pastor that I love them and that I'm committed to them. After United Methodist... Somebody shout, there's been a breach! <laughs> Hit it. Go ahead. I know y'all playing with them lights. How do we get it from that to this? that someday, at a point in history, there would be an end of an age, an end of an era, in which he would return to earth again. And this has been the hope of the church down through the centuries. When you say the Apostles' Creed in your church on Sunday, as many churches do say it, we repeat that he's coming to judge the quick and the dead. Every time you take communion, you're remembering the Lord's death till he comes. That's what communion is all about in the church. We remember the day he died and shed his blood, but we're also remembering the day that he's to come again. That's what he said. And if the Bible teaches anything, it teaches that Jesus Christ is coming back. Now, all the way through the Old Testament, how did we get from preaching on the second coming of Christ to drag me to church Sundays? Now, you don't tell them to shh. At least somebody's helping me preach this morning. Amen. <laughs> Hit it. And raising the stakes, Talbot, a national church leader, gives his blessing to gay marriages. I call on the more than 1,100 clergy to perform marriages among same-sex couples and to do so in the normal course of their pastoral duties. Since the convention, Many Methodist ministers, especially in the Western United States, have heeded the bishop's call. In Tacoma, Washington, Gordon Hutchins was among the first after voters in his state legalized gay marriage. When this couple told me that they had been praying for 40 years that someday they would be able to be married in their church. I had no choice, even if it was in violation of the Book of Discipline, in violation of the rules of our church. Violation, Wayne you and Michael, believe it. You have declared your consent and vows before God and this gathering of family and friends. You have told the world that you are one. This is just something between Michael and myself and God. I don't want to be married like in a courtroom. I want God's blessing. I want to be able to stand up before my Christ. 
and my God and say, here is my mate, and I want to stay with my mate for eternity. I announce to you that they are legally married in the eyes of the state of Washington. Turn it off. Ain't nobody want to see anybody kiss the bride. Amen. You better understand we don't hate those people. We love them enough to tell them the truth. Now, if you question that, then, you, then you've missed everything. You better hear me today. They are in a building that's burning on fire. They are headed to destruction. And nobody going to just walk by and wave at them and say, oh, look, they're they happy. No, somebody that loves them enough is going to shout out, the building's on fire, get out. That's where the security breach is at today. Man, I, I got to clear that atmosphere with some good preaching. Hit another one. R.W. Shambaugh. In that name, in that fourth chapter of Acts, Verse number 12, it says, There is no other name under heaven given to man whereby we must be saved. Hear me, world, I'm talking to you now. Jesus is the only one that demands worship from every human being. He is the only way. Now, either Jesus was a fanatic or an escapee from a mental hospital, or he was God. Buddha came on the scene and said, I had a vision. Muhammad come along and said, I have a dream. But along come Jesus, and he said, everybody that came before me is a thief and a liar. He said, I didn't have a dream, and I didn't have a vision, but I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the only name. You're not saved in the name of a man. You're not saved in the name of a church. There's no church that can save your soul. There's not a bishop with his collar on that can save you. The only one that can save your soul is Jesus Christ. He died for you on Calvary. Can you shout praise the Lord somebody? Jesus. What is... Now let's go to a church in Iowa and listen them to their prayer, praying to the God of pronouns. And that's where we're at today, the God of pronouns. Hit it. So today I wish to pray a prayer that was written for this incredible day. Will you pray with me? Oh God of pronouns, we give praise to the Great One the one who was identifiable as God. I am what I am, you say. The guy in the back's the lost. The great day. The incarnate he and she, the God of trans being. The God of trans being. Impregnating Mary. Impregnating Fathering Mary. God. Breastfeeding God of many breasts. You shadow, you shatter all stereotypes, making every single person Male and female. Listen. Male and female, intersex, non-binary. In non-binary. Exactly in your image. Spectrum, rainbow God, who put your promise for non-violence in the symbol for queer love before humanity knew, because you knew. Who had Joseph, who could not sleep with a woman, in a beautiful lady's cloak, perhaps of rainbow colors, before we knew, you knew. God of pronouns who said, you can call me he or she or they, whatever makes you feel closest to me. Invisible and visible God, on this day, where visibility and celebration, belated, belatedness, Affirmation and acceptance is the bare minimum. Remind us that you are the God of pronouns, so you affirm and you celebrate them. God of Saul, Paul, Simon, Isaac. All right, let's kill it. Jacob, Isaac. 
anybody getting sick? I said, is anybody getting sick? I said, there's been a security breach, church. There's been, how did we get to that? Somebody in this room, help me understand how we got there. She messed up her own prayer, too. If we was to play it, at the very end of it, she prays the Lord's Prayer, which is our Father, which art in heaven. I'm like, you messed up everything you just said about the God of pronouns by calling him our Father. Let me play one last preaching video. Let me take you way back to the days of Jack Coe. Well, maybe not. We're living in the day that Isaiah described. Turn it the up. The Bible said men have due near me with their mouths and with their lips they're honoring God, but they don't have their heart in their worship. There's a lot of people that the only way you can get them to praise God is tell them to. You've got to get up and say, let's everybody say glory, and then they all holler glory. And then you say, now dear one, say praise the Lord, and then they all holler praise the Lord. It sounds like a bunch of old Paul parents. I believe if you can't praise God without somebody telling you to, I believe you need to get an involved and pray through until the praise of God gets back down in your heart where you can praise God without being told to praise God. Men have drew near God with their lips and with their mouths. They're honoring God, but they're not worshiping God from their heart. We have a lot of churchianity, but let me tell you something. We got very little Christianity. We have a great big possession, but brother, we got a little old bitty possession. Hallelujah. People have turned with itching ears from the Word of God. They want to hear stories and fables and moving picture shows. They want everything in the world except thus saith the Lord. It's got the place where you can't tell the world from the church. He said it's got to the place church you can't the tell the world the from the church. Go to church. Church goes to the hell holes, the hell holes go to church. Amen. Church goes out on dancing parties and the dancing parties come to church. You can't tell which one's the world and which one's the church. The church is weakened by sin. A lot of our churches have bridge plans, cigarette-sucking women in the church that claim to be children of God. Quiet in here. And a lot of our churches are not even good soup kitchens. All they do is have chicken and ice cream and tea parties. And let me tell you something, a church that has to serve chicken and ice cream and tea to get people out to church, they're as dead as a chicken, as cold as the ice cream, and as weak as a tea. That's good, that's good. Let's I stop believe people ought that's to go good. to church because they love God. Pastor Josh, go ahead and come, brother. My question to us today is how did this happen? Where were the watchmen? Give, give us some house lights. Where were the watchmen on the wall? When did we allow a breach in the wall of the church and exchange God's holiness for entertainment when did we exchange prophesying and preaching from or to indoctr indoctrinating our children with the junk we just heard that God is a trans God and a gender fluid God and a God of pronouns 
I've just come to ask us today, where are the watchmen on the walls? Where are the watchmen that Isaiah 62 verse 6 talk about? Isaiah said, on your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all day and all night, and they shall never be silent, they shall never sleep. Two things Isaiah said about a watchman. Number one, they cry out. And number two, they don't sleep. Where is the church that will cry out for righteousness and arise and awaken and sound the alarm? Watchmen on the wall, they don't sleep. They cry out day and night. This is why I open with saying what I'm preaching today may not make me popular, but it does make us a watchman. Isaiah 56 verses 10 and 11 tell us where they are. He says his watchmen are blind. They are all without knowledge. They're all silent dogs. They cannot bark. They're dreaming. They're lying down, loving to slumber. Yes, they're greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Every one of them are Are you hearing me today, church? Isaiah said they're blind watchmen. They're dumb dogs. What he was saying is they're supposed to be watchdogs. They're supposed to be guard dogs that when an intruder walks into the house, when someone walks in that isn't supposed to be there, when someone, when somebody, listen, we could stop 100% of church shootings if somebody would start discerning when somebody's in the room that's not supposed to be in the room. We could stop My God, I wish somebody would get up on their feet and help this preacher preach. I'm ready to tell the devil to get out of this church. Dumb dogs. I didn't get you to lay there and eat your little puppy treats. And when an intruder walks in, you barely lift your head up and put it back down. I got you so that when somebody breaks through that door, my God, you'll start barking. You'll awaken the master. You'll grab a hold of his ankle and start chewing at him and run him out of the house. You dumb dog, you. You dumb blind dog. Where are the guard dogs is what Isaiah was saying. Where's the bark? He said in Isaiah 56, he says they're all silent dogs. He said they cannot bark. You know what that means? Sit down. Sit down. It means they can't preach. They can't bark. It says they can't preach. They're not preaching the truth. They're lazy, they're asleep, they're a dumb dog, an intruder comes in and they just lay there. He called them greedy dogs. In Jesus' day, red letter, Jesus called them the blind leading the blind, blind guides. We've stopped guarding the wall. Oh God, I feel this. We've stopped guarding the wall. We've stopped guarding the church. The pulpit went to sleep, the pew got comfortable and we quit watching the wall. We didn't see evil coming. We didn't see that enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We didn't see him come in, but he snuck in. He crept in unaware. Oh, God. He snuck into our pulpits. And now there's a gap in the wall. And unauthorized access to the church has been made possible for Satan to release demonic spirits and false teachers and false prophets into the church. And we've come to the point, my God help us, where we can't even recognize real from false anymore. Truth from deceit, from the holy, from the unholy, from the church, from the world, from good, from bad. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call good evil and evil good and who call bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Why am I preaching this way? Because there's a bitter taste in my mouth. I can't watch what you and I just watched without a bitter taste touching my tongue today. 
I can't taste it. I can't stand it. It's bitter. God's looking for somebody, and I'm done, I promise you. He's looking for somebody in 2022 who will simply say, God, here I am. I will stand in the gap. I will be a repairer of the breach. I will be a watchman on the wall. God, help us repair it so I can quit preaching on these jellyback preachers. Amen. Preachers who were silent when Roe v. Wade was overturned. They had nothing to say because they didn't want to offend the Democrats. And the baby killing people sitting on their pews. They said nothing. Oh. Oh. I could play you videos of David Wilkerson, a call to anguish. Y'all have heard that, huh? I'm done, I'm done. Wolves and sheep clothing. That's why we've got to learn to detect and to discern. Everybody say detect and discern. The reason is because there's been a security breach in the house of God and you don't know who's sitting next to you. We've got to detect and we've got to discern. And, and the reason is because the devil ain't coming in here looking like the devil. He comes in here as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he masquerades himself as an angel of light. He looks good. It looks beautiful. I'm used to preachers. I know i got to finish my life. Sister, I know you feel that. You feel that anguish on you right there. I'm used to preachers. I grew up with preachers who raised up a standard. I grew up in a church where you didn't have to wonder why, right from wrong. I'm used to preachers who lived above reproach. I'm used to preachers when they stepped in the pulpit, they could say, thus saith the Lord. I'm used to preachers who spent more time on their knees than they did in their microphone. I'm used to preachers who preach the Word. So if you're here this morning and you're saying, Pastor, I'm ready. To say, here I am, I'll get in the gap, I'll stand in the breach, I'll repair the wall. You gotta understand that's our job right now. We are the secret service to the president. And I don't mean the one in Washington, D.C., we're the secret service to the president. We better get back to being the secret service to the pulpit. To the pulpit. Just because they look good, sound good, and everybody comes and hears them don't mean they ought to be in our pulpits. The president, we got to guard the president. We got to guard the pulpit. We got to guard the pew. We got to guard the prayer room. We got to guard the praise. There's a four or five point sermon right there. President, pulpit, pew, praise, prayer, guard the power got to guard the praise somebody sent me a text last night I already had all these videos sent to Josh they was ready days ago somebody sent a text said pastor did you see what's on Facebook I said what I said your favorite worship team Maverick City Maverick City we sing a lot of their songs man they're amazing I said worship service last night they brought Kirk Franklin up cussing Kirk cussing Kirk homosexual approving cussing Kirk to help him lead worship they said you gotta see it just keep the lights on hit it church service
Dirty Dancing. Take that twerk and shut it. If you ever get up here and act like that, you'll be looking for you a new job. I ain't got to worry about you. That. Stand to your feet. I could show you video after video. See, some of you from about a decade ago, your favorite people was Hill Songs. Hill Songs. Mine too, until at their women's conference, their youth pastor came out as the naked cowboy imitating the Times Square naked cowboy in New York City. That's right. In Speedos with a guitar covering his front, their youth pastor, Hill Songs. Darlene Sheck, that was a different Hill song. We have fallen. Carl Lentz, their pastor at that time. His wife sitting on the front row with the naked cowboy at their women's conference. I got the video, but my wife said, don't play it. Don't play it. I sent it to you, but I'm going to let her win that one. Y'all feel this today? Bow your heads for just a moment. I know we went over. I know it went late. Bow your heads. We better get back to guarding because there's been a security breach. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. I said, Lord, how do you want me to end this altar service? He said, I want you to lay hands on everybody in this room who's willing to stand in the gap. And I want you to release an impartation today. An impartation of a guardian. I want to impart into you the impartation of a pastor's heart. A pastor guards. A pastor's a shepherd. I want to lay my hand on you, and there's too many of you for me to pray an hour for all of you. I'm going to take the oil, and I'm just going to simply touch you and believe that heaven is going to impart into your life today a watchman anointing. And God says, when you do, I'm going to begin waking my people up with prophetic dreams. I'm going to begin to wake them up. I heard the Lord say at the 3 o'clock hour and give them words that are, that are, an, that are as an alarm sounding for the church. I, I, I heard the Lord say that when they receive this impartation, they're going to have a, 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 a visibility to be able to detect and discern like they've never been able to before. Church, what we do not need is more prosperity in America, in America's church. We need more discernment. We need more detection. And I'm going to lay hands on you and I'm going to say God, impart it right now. And I believe the church of Jesus Christ is about to bark, not in hatred, not in, not in condemnation, but in warning. Listen, if you've got a guard dog and he he barks and wakes you up out of your sleep. Don't get mad at him. You better be thankful you got somebody telling you there was somebody trying to get into your house. And I've come to tell you, there's been some people get into our house, get into the church. But today, the church is going to rise up and say, Lord, if you're seeking a man, then my God, here I am. Get out of your seat and run right now. Run. Get up to this altar. Push up close.
Thank you for tuning into Tag Church here in Little Rock, Arkansas. We pray that this message will truly be a blessing to you today. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can do so by visiting us at www.tagchurch.net. Also, if you have any prayer requests, please don't hesitate to send them to the email request on your screen. We would love to partner with you in prayer. Now, I hope you are ready for a word from the Lord today. Let's get right into it, and God bless you. 